Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Deason, and I'm here today to talk about uh, creating a collaborative agency culture that scales. And I wrote that title, I think, about 10 minutes before the submission deadline, and I didn't really know what I was going to say at the time. And as I kind of wrote it, um, I realized that what I was actually kind of writing was the, um, the story of our growing pains, kind of as we've um, grown and developed as an agency and increased in size. And I think what I kind of found, I was writing the story of kind of what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and what we still don't understand about um, what we're going to do next. Um, and so I've deliberately left some time for questions at the end, because I think some of this stuff to me is most interesting kind of in discussion um, and in the detail rather than the kind of big theory, because I definitely don't have the kind of magic answer um, of how you uh, do this, but I can say what's worked for us and what hasn't worked for us. And kind of in, in that same kind of time of writing the story, I realized a lot of that was also my own personal development, uh, learning kind of how to get out of the way, working, learning how to um, work in a very small team to a much bigger team. Um, and that was, I didn't really find there was kind of a right way or a wrong way to do that or a way that I would definitely recommend that everyone should do it. But I thought um, there was definitely some lessons and um, some kind of findings that I'd, um, I thought were worth sharing. Um, so a bit of background about kind of who we are, because I think it's important to understand, you know, the size that we are now, the size of where we came from, um, to kind of understand the, uh, the context of what I'm saying. Um, so today, uh, we're just over 30 people. I think we've uh, probably added a couple of people in the last uh, month or so. So, and we're about doing about two million pounds um, worth of uh, Drupal build services. So. Um, we only have uh, full-time permanent employees. We don't uh, use kind of contractors and freelancers that much. Um, and we tend to do full service. So we do a discovery and a production phase. And that means we have the UX, uh, the design, the project management, and the development um, all in-house. And over the past probably two or three years, we're kind of growing about 30 or 40% um, year on year. But in the past, our growth was much uh, slower than that, which I'll talk about uh, in a sec. So yeah, we started back in... Uh, 2001, which I realized made me about 20, which I think was probably responsible for some of our growing pains. Um, I was, I had kind of a development background. I was working doing project management, the new business stuff, and <coughs> initially just working with a designer. So the two of us um, were kind of all together in one room. Um, we didn't really need lots of kind of documentation and process. It was quite easy to um, collaborate. We didn't kind of have a Google Calendar where we'd put meetings down and things, because that would have been ridiculous. Um, and it was really, really efficient. So we spent lots of the time um, uh, on the work, really. We didn't really have to kind of spend lots of time planning um, how we were going to schedule things or how we were going to manage things. Um, and we won some small accounts, and we kind of um, started to grow and add a couple more people. Um, we won things like the British Alpaca Society and helped them uh, manage their herds was one of our kind of early projects. Um, and we carried on kind of growing. Um, we picked up people like uh, Robbie Williams, I think, um, about six years ago, uh, Johnson & Johnson, so kind of um, some B2B enterprise work, uh, people like ITV, who are one of the media, uh, big media company in the UK. And by about 2012, uh, we were about 16 people. We were doing about a million pounds, um, probably a little bit over in um, turnover. And on paper, you know, I think you know, things uh, felt good. We'd uh, had a very slow growth in some ways, but I think that was partly because we'd um, started a little bit accidentally. I don't think we'd meant to start an agency. I think we just started doing some work, so there wasn't really a big plan. Um, and we were still you know, really, really efficient. Um, there was kind of minimal meetings still with those kind of 16, 18 people, um, the minimal unbillable time, so we were spending all of our time um, on client work rather than on kind of internal process stuff. Um, and most of, we probably only had one or two, maybe one even, um, unbillable roles. So pretty much everyone was focused on delivering projects kind of every day. And I think it was around that sort of time it started to be um, probably a bit painful in some ways. I think um, where it felt kind of easy and fun, easy and fun, easy and fun, it, it didn't really kind of seem to be um, true anymore or quite as true. Um, I was involved in most decisions, and I think that was kind of through that organic growth um, that we were still kind of very flat, and or flat plus me in a way. Um, and when you kind of, obviously, if you're involved in kind of running an agency or working in an agency, you kind of know some of the sorts of tasks and um, issues that kind of you're dealing with, and often some of them are very short-term focused. We need to do a pitch on Thursday. We need to do six days of pitch work in the next two days. We've also had a deadline for three months we need to hit. 
we're running our recruitment pipeline, we're running our sales pipeline. There's lots of kind of conflicting pressures that um, I think you can be in, um, in an agency environment, and some of them require that long-term view, and some of them require a much kind of shorter-term view. And I think, you know, to me, scheduling is a... I've always hated scheduling, I think. Um, it's, it's a really complicated, annoying thing because you've got so many different dependencies between clients signing things off, if they're late signing something off, then by the time uh, you know you, you push back your kind of front end build, for example, then that team's waiting for work and knocking into another piece of work. And there's just that there's those really kind of um, difficult to get around um, issues that also have a kind of commercial impact, I guess. Um, and I think when you do it badly, it starts to get um, kind of slow and difficult. And we were starting to get to the size where there wasn't a simple way to schedule those teams anymore. Uh, also, holding the major client relationships, which when we were, I guess, dealing with someone like the British Alpaca Society, they had a relatively kind of unsophisticated um, digital requirements. But as we started to pick up those bigger clients, what they wanted from the relationship with us was much more complex. I think they wanted to be able to be looking at their kind of three-year plans with us. They wanted to be um, really spending a lot more time in kind of engaging with us. And we hadn't really built the way for um, the team to be working on projects that weren't defined quite well. Um, and I think that was starting to leave me with a feeling um, that my head was starting to hurt, that it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't really all kind of all fit in there anymore, I guess. Um, and that was probably an expression by Friday afternoon that was fairly common. Um, and I think, you know, aside from me, I kind of became more conscious that I think we were definitely wasting people in the, um, people in the team's time um, and probably their motivation. And I think I see those as kind of two different things. You can waste people's time in the sense that um, they don't have something kind of useful to do. But I think when you waste their motivation, what you're kind of, when you waste their time a lot, you start to waste their motivation. And that kind of teaches them that it's not useful to be looking for the right things to do because there's always going to be an inefficiency or a blocker in stopping them do that, doing that. And I think that can start to kill that kind of spark and enthusiasm when you're always kind of thinking, well, should I bother going to find out what's going on with this? Maybe not, actually, because um, I don't think I'll be able to resolve it. Um, and that kind of, you know, I kind of realized, I think, that it was effectively I was micromanaging people. And I don't think it was an explicit, deliberate kind of thing um, that I did. I think it was a kind of an accidental, organic growth. And these were, you know, smart, talented people that we'd worked really hard to recruit, that we respected their opinion. We'd, we, kind of, we would put them in these roles for a reason. But I think we were struggling to then actually make sure we use the capacity they had and the skills and the ability. Um, and I think it was that point we kind of felt really stuck in a way because we'd had this, we'd had this kind of success and growth and we'd been working our way through things. Um, but we didn't really feel kind of, it didn't feel like more of this was possible because if we kept growing, it felt like these kind of problems um, would get kind of worse, I guess, not better. And I'd always really been, I think, excited about our future. I, you know, obviously, um, started the company and kind of driven it along. But I thought, well, actually, I'm not really sure what we'd have more of if we carried on doing this. Um, and growth, you know, there wasn't really possible to plan for growth, I think, at that point, because it wasn't clear how would we, how would we do that. And so we kind of started to, I mean, I started thinking um, there's obviously something kind of we're going to need to change to have, um, you know, a bigger kind of brighter future and trying to kind of understand the background of what was there. I think there was obviously the fact I was a bottleneck. Um, we would kind of what had been really efficient in a small team was starting to kind of cause a problem. Um, and looking at the root causes of that, I think um, we didn't have the right data. So we didn't have systems that were giving us good information about um, what was going on at the time. Uh, and, and that's both, I think, retrospectively and kind of forecasting that. Um, we didn't have the right structure of people, so we didn't have um, the, the kind of uh, the roles that where people could make the right decisions. Um, and we didn't have the kind of process points. So we didn't have a place where there was a natural place for that person to make the decision at the time. And up until then, kind of everything had been in my head, which had been efficient in the sense that I could kind of map it out, but it wasn't in my head anymore because we were too big. Um, and it was really clear that you know we had these people with skills and knowledge and expertise that was um, greater than mine in probably most areas, if not all. And we were kind of wasting um, that opportunity because they could have made these better decisions more quickly than I could, um, but we weren't kind of giving them um, that opportunity. And that was really because of that kind of slow, centralized um, model that had worked at a small size, but now really wasn't working at a larger size. 
um, and that was obviously frustrating. I didn't really feel that I would be doing, I was doing my job as well anymore. It was, certainly wasn't as much fun. And I think um, it was probably frustrating um, for everyone else, particularly the people who really felt that we could do something differently or, or move more quickly. And I think that was kind of, it became clear there was kind of fundamental changes we needed to make. Um, I think restoring that engagement, so re restoring that kind of energy and drive that we'd had um, to make sure that we could keep kind of pushing on into the future and finding a new operational model, like finding a new way that we could um, keep working that was going to have to probably be a complete replacement for the old one. Um, and I think often the challenge with kind of organizational change is you're still delivering projects. So you still have these commitments, you still have these deadlines, you still have recruitment, you still have sales, you have all these things kind of going on. And you end up in this kind of changing the, um, you know, the tire of the car going down the motorway type problem where you're trying to kind of both, you both need to think the distance to be able to have the insight to see what you need to change, but you also need the actual time to implement those changes as well. And I think that can be, um, that can be something that can be quite difficult to find. And so we started to kind of think about some kind of quick win solutions, you know, what, what, what could we do? Um, and one of them was, well, you know, management um, has been around a long time. It's not kind of a, a very um, new concept. So, you know, could we hire managers? Is that what we were kind of lacking? And on paper, I think obviously, yes, you can have a management hierarchy, you can have delegation. Um, but I kind of felt that people knew what the right thing to do was. I didn't really feel that we needed to add people to tell, more, tell these people what to do. I think I felt the problem was that people weren't really empowered. They didn't really have the right information. So kind of hiring people in to tell people to do the thing that they already wanted to do in the first place seemed a bit kind of expensive um, and weird. Um, and I think, you know, there's there kind of, it felt like there was a software option, I guess, as well. So there's kind of those agency management tools that um, do everything from your sales pipeline to your bug tracking, to your resourcing, to your forecasting. And um, I didn't really know anyone who'd had a good experience with them. Um, I didn't think that, I didn't really believe in them actually, to be honest, but also I think they would have just given us more information and we didn't really have a model to make decisions with that information in, so it wouldn't have actually really fundamentally addressed the problem. And I think, you know, what we really needed was both kind of better tools. We needed a way to have this information, but we also needed a way to, um, to have a new model to actually make use of that information. And then I thought, well, again, you know, I don't think this is the first time, you know, agencies aren't you, digital agencies aren't you. This isn't the kind of the first time that um, anyone else has been here before. Um, people have grown and outgrown their kind of um, model before. And of course, you know, yeah, they have. This question is much older than digital agencies, much older than agencies. Um, there's a guy called Ricardo Semler uh, in the 70s in Brazil. Um, and he, I think he had about, I think it was tens of millions or low hundreds of millions of turnover. And he was a, uh, he uh, owned an industrial manufacturing company. So they um, produced, you know, industrial dishwashers, industrial washing machines, um, et cetera. And he kind of saw huge in, uh, kind of inefficiencies in bureaucracy in the, um, in his organization. And one day he just decided to sack about 60% of the uh, management and he thought, well, we're gonna have some problems if we do that, but actually I'd rather have the problems um, that come with this than, I'd, than I would have about having all of these managers who kind of get in the way. So he created this system where um, the teams could hire each other or within the team they could hire each other, fire each other, uh, set their own pay, choose their own suppliers, choose their own product lines and their own prices. So he really had decided that those managers weren't kind of adding value anymore and that was something that would be far better done by uh, the people who were delivering the work day to day. And that felt, I think, really intriguing. Um, he'd written about it in this book uh, called Maverick in the 80s um, and he'd gone through kind of a through um, iterations with it and, and had some success, although he changed some bits of it quite fundamentally later on. And it felt, I think, like the right direction, but it also felt like a huge leap. It didn't feel um, that it was something that we kind of had the confidence to say, well, if work, this worked for a fridge manufacturer in Brazil in the 80s, and it'll definitely work for a Drupal agency in the UK. I mean, one's a product business, one's a service business. Uh, one was 35 years ago. There's quite a, bit, a few things there that I didn't really feel that this was kind of an obvious thing to just um, to jump in and do. And there's kind of, there's some kind of closer to home um, kind of, interesting kind of writing and thoughts about this is Basecamp. Um, they've written a lot about the kind of motivation, uh, company culture, scaling beyond a founder, 
Um, they've got a couple of books, single, Signal versus Noise and Rework, that are worth um, reading. They're not, they're quite good on the principles, I think. They're also a product business, so they're slightly harder to apply, again, directly to an agency. Um, but they, they don't kind of waffle on too much either. They're quite kind of short and succinct. So they're worth a read if you just want to, to kind of get a conversation going at the office or try and explore some of those topics. They're, they're worth a look. There's also a startup in the US called Buffer, um, and they've been documenting their journey um, on their blog about self-managing teams. So they've, I think they've been doing it probably for about 18 months, a couple of years, and they've been quite honest. They've given some quite good write-ups about kind of what's worked and not worked. Um, so they do things like you do the team set their own salaries. Um, they got rid of management appraisals, I think, so that you can uh, each the uh, individuals kind of score each other and set salaries and things. And they've they've actually put back in place some of the things they took away because they found that those, for example, mentoring really did have value. So not giving feedback to people or not allowing people to um, have someone uh, more experienced than them tell them how they were doing, they actually realised was something that they did want to keep. Um, and there's also a really interesting talk I saw yesterday, actually, which I just uh, slipped into the slides this morning. Um, I think it's pronounced Leap. Um, they're a Swiss company, um, a Drupal agency, agency, actually, and they're quite a lot further down the road um, with this than we are. And it was a really good um, talk called Teal is the New Orange, which you can um, find the recordings already up on the website. And they've, they've gone kind of completely flat. They don't have the concept of kind of shareholders. It's very um, a, a flat structure. I think they're about 100 people and doing about 8 or 9 million Swiss francs worth of turnover. So they've managed to kind of scale quite a long way through that. And I definitely recommend having a look at that um, talk if that's something you're interested in. And so kind of from that background reading, and unfortunately I didn't see the talk yesterday before, so I, I was working on bad information at the time, but on that background reading, the kind of there was a couple of takeaways, I think, and a couple of themes that I thought we really did, should kind of need to apply. Um, I think one of those was intrinsic motivation. So if someone's intrinsically motivated to do something, if it's something that they just enjoy doing and would kind of do if they weren't getting paid for it, if no one was standing over them making it do it, I think you can kind of start to understand your organizational culture based on if there's things that people just really hate doing and you've created an environment they hate doing in it, then management starts to become a cost of how do you monitor and force people to do something they don't want to do. If you can find the right people and the right tasks and create the right environment, then you're probably not going to have that resistance of um, how many ways can we force people and how many ways can they try and get away with not doing something. I think you can kind of start to break away a lot from that is, is what I found. And also, I think, as a company, it's something we'd failed to do for a long time, I think, was probably setting clear goals. So really high-level, um, probably quarterly, annual, and three-year goals. And you can also do a 10-year goal if you really want to make sure you kind of have a, a really clear arc of direction that you're taking. Um, if you don't do that, then you're not really enabling people to act um, independently or um, to kind of collaborate without your direct instruction because without any clear kind of um, purpose, how can people make those kind of right smart decisions on your behalf? And I think that was something we kind of got stuck in a loop in almost of having to be um, two directional because we didn't really have this big picture, clear idea of where we're going. We'd grown luckily and successfully through a kind of opportunistic, um, an opportunistic approach. But I think as we got bigger, there wasn't that, that wasn't really gonna kind of cut, the, um, cut it anymore. Um, and I think finally, this is definitely you know really relevant to um, you know to founders, founders or kind of management team. If you're going to do these things or um, try and roll them out, you need to need to look really hard at yourself. I think to make sure that you can actually see through your part of the bargain. So if you, there's no point kind of saying these things um, if your actions uh, immediately um, discount them. And I think that kind of personal reflection and the personal growth you might need to do to make sure that you can actually. Um, try and kind of support these kind of initiatives if it is something you choose to do is something that's um, well worth kind of focusing on. So kind of into the action, I guess. Um, in January, um, we started kind of rolling this out. So we'd spent kind of a little bit of time in the painful stage and a little bit of time um, working out um, what we were going to do. And uh, we started uh, kind of creating a new decent handbook. So um, there's another director, Simon, um, we put kind of together in a Google Doc um, how we thought the kind of the highest level kind of company operation stuff um, should work and we probably spent about a week or two on it. I think we'd kind of built up in our heads kind of an idea of what, how we thought it um, should go. And then we, we shared it for kind of comment changes and debate. So we deliberately put it in an open document format that everyone could um, 
have input into, and we probably spent, I think, about a month working on it with everyone, um, and it did change a lot. There was things that we thought we wanted that people really resisted, and I think they were really right to resist, actually. I think there were some bad ideas that got cleaned out in that process. Um, there were some kind of questions about things where people just didn't really feel confident or that it was clear how things would work. And there was lots of kind of edge case, well, what if this and what if that kind of stuff that we, we tried to satisfy with a kind of a different approach rather than creating a kind of 400 page long document that had every um, possible outcome in. And to kind of, to, to drive that document, I think um, we thought it would be, we needed to kind of create some principles that we all could agree on. And I think a key part of that document was the, the kind of debate and discussion process um, was what made it something everyone bought into rather than it just being um, something that was kind of pushed on people because I don't think it would have really worked if we'd taken that approach. Um, so we created these five principles and, and we also kind of made some fundamental modifications to our working practices um, because we thought we need to get this different kind of mindset happening if we're going to continue to kind of grow in the future. And so those new principles, um, the first one was uh, our team members are intrinsically motivated and know how to get their own job best. So not spending lots of time on monitoring people, not spending lots of processes on working out what people are doing or if they're doing what they should be doing. We're going to make the assumption in the company um, culture we build and the systems we build that people actually do want to get their job done and the company's job is as much to get out of the way of that as it is to, um, to try and enforce it because do we want to put that much energy into the kind of enforcement aspect of things. Principle two was uh, everyone must have a meaningful input to have a culture of continuous improvement. So by meaningful input, we meant that it's no point saying, well, anyone can change anything, or we always want to hear what you think. If you don't act on that, and if you don't provide a process that that actually happens within, then people are going to learn really quickly that you actually don't care or haven't found a way of caring yet. Um, so we wanted to make it sure that it was really clear that if it was someone, if someone could make a change that was within their kind of um, remit, I guess, that they should just make that change themselves. They didn't need permission. If it's something that did need discussion, then the smallest group of people um, possible should make that decision as quickly as possible, rather than it being something that we were kind of waiting on a hierarchy to do. Uh, principle three was focus on results, not process. So we need as a company or a project on whatever level we're working on, um, to determine what the results we're looking for. We need to launch this thing by this date. The process of how we get there, we should have as little touch on as possible, but enough to make sure that we're not kind of reinventing wheels. Um, and principle four was around knowledge work. So, you know, we do knowledge work in agencies. We're creative, whether that's through coding or design. Um, we're solving problems, and it's, we're using kind of bits of our brain that we can't just turn up at work for six, seven, eight hours a day, and the work happens. It's not work that we can just do by being present. We actually have to bring that kind of time and energy to it, um, or that focus to it. And we all have good days, we all have bad days, we all have times of the day where we're not that productive, we all have different kind of lifestyle choices or commitments that mean our lives are different shapes. And what we wanted to do was actually say, we really will care about the results, and we don't really care about, you know, measuring who's in the office at 9 a.m. isn't really any useful measurement of productivity. It just shows who's physically in the office at 9 a.m. And principle five was that big principles are more useful than small rules. So we really wanted to keep this kind of really simple. We didn't want to end up with a, a kind of contract of employment style um, intranet or um, kind of system that governed um, the kind of working practices. We wanted to just make sure we had some bigger tests to kind of ask around those things. Um, and we felt that we were trying to give people kind of a map and assume the people we recruited um, and had within the team um, would have great judgment. That was why we'd recruited in the first place. So let's not spend loads of time then assuming that they don't want to do the job or they're not happy or they, they're not going to um, be engaged. And I think some of those things, they're kind of not, I don't think many people would necessarily disagree with them personally. I think you know, they kind of seem obvious, um, but I think it's a lot harder in practice or in company cultures where you evolve what you would like to kind of say on your poster of this is how things are, but it's actually a lot harder to make sure those happen, things happen every day. And it was something we were really kind of conscious of is that this didn't really feel kind of like rocket science, but it also felt like something that we certainly weren't in the place when we introduced them. Um, that certainly wasn't true. We also had these... Uh, the kind of the working practice stuff that we changed. So in the past, we've been quite traditional. Everyone was largely based in one office, um, working a kind of a nine to five. 
um, and we started to roll out these changes. So things like a personal tool budget. So every member of staff, um, I think it's 500 pounds a year, they can spend on whatever they think um, helps them do their job better. So the company still supply, supplies kind of laptops, software, the kind of core stuff. Um, and we deliberately didn't put this up for approval. Um, the only, so you didn't need to get approval before you bought something. You could use it for a standing desk, a wireless mouse, a window shade, whatever it is that, that kind of helps. Um, we just put it in a central Google Doc so that there's that transparency, and particularly for tool sharing, if someone had bought a Wacom tablet or something, to make sure that we didn't end up with eight, and actually we only ever needed kind of three at once. We also introduced kind of a flexible hours, so effectively you could decide when you wanted to work. Um, there's some kind of, we, we introduced the, a kind of the only limitation to that was really around core hours, so if it was working, if it was a day that you were going to work, then you needed to be available, I think it's between um, 10 and two, but other than that, you can um, hit your kind of hours target for the week um, at any time that you want to. And we also introduced distributed working at that point. So um, you can decide where the most appropriate place is for you to work. It could be at home, it could be at a different city, it could be you know, a cafe in town, whatever the, whatever the kind of choice is. Um, when we first introduced it, and up until now, um, we've had uh, a guide of that three of those days um, should be in the office, but we're kind of trying to work out whether that actually makes any difference or not. Um, and whether it's actually quite different for different roles, because if you're working in reception, for example, greeting clients, that's quite difficult to do from home, where other roles are a lot more straightforward. And we also, we'd kind of had this, but didn't really say it very clearly, I don't think. We introduced an unlimited training budget so that um, people just needed to demonstrate the business value of what they wanted to do, but really were pe selling people's kind of expertise. And if we felt that if someone, we wanted to have no barrier there really, if someone felt they needed those extra skills, then um, they should kind of go and get them. Um, if you were pitching kind of kite surfing or something, I think you'd have to work a bit hard to make sure that there was a business value case, but otherwise you could kind of go for it. And to wrap those up, to kind of put some structure around how that worked, um, we had a target number of um, billing hours per week. So as long as you, um, you could kind of do all those things in any way you wanted, the thing we were kind of really caring about, the thing we um, knew that mattered to us as a company, as a company that sells time, was the weekly billing target. So that was the kind of structure around it. Um, it was up to you how you got there. Um, and there's lots of reasons you could miss your weekly target. So it wasn't that there was this kind of a commutative um, you know, issue. If you didn't hit it, you might have been doing R&D, you might have been uh, training. There's all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't hit it. Um, but it was just there as a kind of an awareness thing, really, that if you weren't going to hit it, um, that you were kind of thinking about what, what else you were doing that was useful with your time. And to kind of to help people kind of work out what the right thing to do was or to understand the new system, we added these um, self-checks, so kind of questions that you could ask yourself um, or someone else. If they were saying, I'm going to go and work in uh, Belize for the next three months, um, we wanted to make sure there was a, a kind of a, a litmus test to hold these things up to um, and to see if they were, if that, that kind of action would be compatible with what we thought was really important. Um, and these were the three things that we thought were really important. Um, is the way I'm working making our clients happy? Am I effectively collaborating with my team? And am I happy with the quality of my work? So really, those were the things we thought were most important. And actually, if you were saying, able to say yes to all of those, then it was probably going to be okay what you were doing. So that kind of gave us the, the working principles and the, and the practices, but it didn't really uh, kind of fundamentally change how we were going to work as an agency. That didn't give us our kind of operational changes. And back to those points, we kind of needed that better data. Um, we needed it to be available to more people and we needed a new way of making decisions. Um, so we, at the same time, we kind of changed how we were using some of the SaaS platforms we had, introduced some new ones, and also changed some company structure. Um, so we've been using Harvest for a while. We use that for time tracking across the whole company for project budgets, um, and we find that to be, um, to be pretty good, to be honest. Um, we've more recently started using Forecast, which is kind of a sister product to Harvest. Um, that is for team resource planning. Uh, Basecamp, uh, pretty standard for kind of um, baseline kind of uh, team collaboration or client um, collaboration and comms, document storage. Uh, we use Jira um, for more complex projects or bug tracking or um, task tracking. Um, about the same time we rolled out Slack, I think previously we've been using something horrible. I think we have using Jabber actually, using iChat, sort of Mac based, and uh, there was no group chat, I don't think. 
uh, it was, file transfers didn't work. I'm surprised actually we stuck with it so long because looking back it was a complete nightmare. And that Slack has been um, really, really awesome actually. It's, it's, I don't think a lot of what we've done would have been possible um, if we hadn't shifted to Slack. And also we'd um, been using Xero, uh, which is a cloud-based um, accounting package. And that meant we could give everyone access to the financial information, to credit scores, to invoicing information, to so the right people. This kind of collection of tools meant that everyone could pretty much see everything that was going on um, all the time. The problem that we kind of found with that is that we had endless different systems kind of spitting out endless bits of data. And the kind of the short term, there's a longer term solution I'll come on to later, but the short term solution is we started kind of mashing that into Google Sheets. Uh, and that kind of works. So we kind of have a dashboard of project statuses and um, project health that we can see as an overview of all projects that we're working on um, and some different kind of other company metrics. But uh, it's definitely um, not ideal, but it was a lot better than what we had. And to kind of to use this information that we had, we were kind of adding these new um, meetings. So we had a scheduling meeting that had kind of the key, uh, some of the key roles were involved in that and a delivery management meeting. Um, so they would happen every week. There'd be a group of people. They included me um, initially, but um, they don't anymore. And those people would get together to kind of resolve. Delivery management is um, kind of project problems and scheduling is just the um, team scheduling. Um, so scheduling was now made by kind of a, um, that kind of key project team people. And they would discuss kind of schedules conflicts or um, blockers, uh, issues that needed resolving. And that probably, it was probably about February, I guess, um, that rolled out. And there were some negatives. Um, you know, going back to that last slide with a billion dials, we did have endless amounts of stats, but I don't know that we were, in some cases, kind of much wiser for them. So we were generating huge amounts of performance information, but I'm not sure who was actually going to look at it um, or what they were going to do about it. Um, we'd also gone from kind of not much internal meetings and process, and now we had lots of people in lots of meetings. Um, and we hadn't really, in hindsight, we hadn't really worked out a good meeting format, so we didn't have good meeting discipline. So I think things were a lot better, but they were, um, they were, the meetings were too long and unfocused, I think. Um, and we were kind of sharing, back to that dial slide in a way, we were sharing everything um, with everyone, but it wasn't really clear who was supposed to do something about it necessarily. So kind of everyone being able to see everything doesn't necessarily mean that someone's going to do something. It's, um, it can get a bit messy. But actually, you know, um, my feelings, and from what I know of the teams, you know, um, it was overwhelmingly positive. Um, I certainly felt re-energized. I think there was a new purpose and a new kind of um, insight into what we could be kind of doing in the future. People felt, um, I think, a lot more enabled to be able to make changes, to use new tooling. Um, I was talking to someone from the kind of the team last night, and he was saying that the the amount of kind of development process change that we underwent at the same time, and I was saying, well, do you think this was related to that or not? And we were kind of umming and ahhing about whether it would have happened anyway, but it certainly felt like there was a, a big shift in our ability to kind of um, solve problems and do things better, and I think that probably came in some ways from that energy and autonomy. Um, and certainly I think we were having kind of conversations about the important things again, so rather than lots of kind of detailed, nitty-gritty, week-to-week problem stuff that doesn't really change the world, um, we were able to start talking about where we're going to be start hitting these big, bigger goals, what was going on, um, and people were talking about, well, should we add more team members, for example? So there was, there was definitely a shift into the kind of the quality of conversation. And also, you know, I was really surprised, actually. I genuinely didn't know what was going to happen around revenue and profitability. I didn't know if we were going to see a slump um, through kind of change or if we were going to um, have a kind of rough period where we had to do a lot of reorganization, whether this was actually going to work or not. Um, but what we found was that uh, our revenue, which had been growing, actually grew a little bit steeper, um, and profitability actually increased. So I think what we were seeing was some of that, the wasted um, time and energy that the previous model that we should, we'd kind of outgrown had introduced, we were actually able to be able to be delivering in a much more kind of focused way. You know, I had some kind of, well, I think probably everyone did involve, we had some kind of realizations, I guess, um, as we... Uh, as we kind of went through that, um, and some of them were kind of fairly quickly apparent. Um, you know, I think one thing we found, which didn't seem obvious, was that lots of the team 
kind of love their actual job, so they love being a designer, and the idea of sitting in a kind of scheduling meeting for two hours every week is pretty toxic to them. And I think we kind of go along with the idea of, oh, everyone can control their destiny, everyone can kind of change whatever they want. Isn't that a great thing? And I don't think it is, actually. I think you need to be really selective about who's going to do what and why. And we've kind of gone from, I think, one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, but surprisingly, um, not all designers want to run an agency. And in hindsight, I don't blame them, actually. Um, I think realization too that was probably a personal growth one I think was that you know leadership isn't control and control isn't leadership and I think being able to let go of control where it's the only way you know how to because you've grown the business that way in a way that you've been used to having that control I think understanding that I had a different purpose that wasn't about kind of uh, keeping all those plates spinning that there was people who were going to be able to keep better plates spinning um, faster or wherever I'm going with that analogy but they um, they had a kind of it was much clearer that that um, that what the kind of purpose of how those things could work. And I think also, you know, that uh, there wasn't the perfect time for the perfect action. You know, it it will never be the right time to make kind of fundamental changes, and you'll never get it right the very first time. And I think I'm glad, you know, really that we did just get on with it, and we didn't. We accepted that there was going to be some bumpiness, and we did have to change things as we went. Um, but we knew we could be adapt. Uh, we, we knew we could adapt it, and we knew that we wanted to set kind of an aspirational. We really wanted to raise the bar and kind of assume that there wasn't going to be people um, abusing the system. Assume that there wasn't going to be those problems, and actually set a really positive bar out to go. This is how we want to work. And if there really was problems, deal with it, but not kind of build into the system that there was people who really didn't want to um, do it that way. So that kind of took us through to um, probably around. Uh, August uh, kind of time and that's where um, we've we've kind of moving into the next round we've been kind of changing some of those things as we've gone um, but now we're, we're kind of looking at another round I think of bigger changes and that's particularly around growth where we've been able to kind of um, keep that growth going but also around distribu distributed recruitment um, to see what's going to be possible um, in terms of UK and Europe um, of how we recruit because now the kind of the historical team um, has that flexibility and it's increasingly distributed. We've had a couple of distributed hires, I think, in the last um, month. It then means we've our kind of our London and Southeast recruitment pool is much wider now. And I think I think we failed in our kind of knee-jerk swing to the opposite direction. I think we failed at accountability the first time round. Um, I don't think it was clear to anyone, including me, kind of who was definitely accountable for something to be happening. And in the past, it had kind of been in a broken way, I think ultimately me. Um, but we kind of just introduced a different type of broken. Um, and I think that can still waste time um, and energy, and it kind of gets frustrating. And I think we've been lucky that there's a really kind of good um, team uh, ethic. They've worked together a long time. You know, we don't really hit kind of big problems with it. But I think um, there still can be that frustration of who's going to make the final call on a, on a scheduling decision, for example. If there's six people all, who all have conflict in different projects or three different project managers with 10 projects, someone has to win or lose each time. And I think there's not always a clear way that that can be a kind of democratic um, decision around things like resourcing. So th there's a couple of points I'll make later about how we've kind of changed that. But I think we tried to introduce kind of democracy right through um, the kind of the base. And I think we could have done it slightly differently. Um, we're going to, I think we're going to move, we're kind of discussing it at the moment, smaller fixed teams. So rather than trying to schedule a cost 30, 35 people as a resource pool, which in great, is great in theory because you can bring lots of people to a project quickly, in reality that's not, I don't think, how projects work and how people um, run projects and clients. So by having smaller fixed kind of pods of teams who always consistently work together, I think we can kill most of our scheduling complexity and the accountability problem because that team will always work together and is responsible for, for delivering those projects. Uh, I think the kind of once your resourcing gets to beyond a certain point, I think it just becomes really complex, and I'm not sure it's a problem that's um, particularly worth solving because it won't be a free um, solution. And those pod teams will be multidisciplinary, so that's a designer, UX, PM, uh, solution architect, a couple of developers would be kind of a typical base team, um, so they can completely control all of the things they need to do to deliver a project. I think one thing also was around um, kind of company scorecards. So we hadn't really found a way to set out. We'd set kind of some uh, annual goals, but I don't think we'd really found a way to make what were actually connected day-to-day -day actions in with those. 
Um, so we're looking at the moment of how do we build a weekly um, company scorecard which has um, the kind of stats that change on every week um, that we want to have a conversation about if there's something that's um, not kind of looking right. And I think a, a big part of that is something I was reading about recently was the kind of idea of trailing versus leading indicators. Um, and I think new business is a, a good kind of example to, to demonstrate the difference between the two. So revenue, for example, is a, um, a good trailing indicator. It's the outcome of a lots of tasks that you do and, and eventually you actually sell something. The leading indicators to that are probably um, going to a pitch, doing a chemistry meeting, um, how many people have you met at a marketing event, for example. So there's lots of things you might do, I don't know, 10 marketing events to do five pitches, to send three proposals, um, to win one piece of work. And with leading indicators, what you're really trying to do is measure the lead um, through to that final piece of revenue because the leading indicators are the things you can influence. If you know you're not um, going to that many marketing events, for example, that's something you can change quite quickly next week. To actually go and influence your revenue next week is really difficult because you've probably got a two-month um, uh, leading um, kind of trail on that. And those high-level company targets, I think, also was something that we wanted to, to work on on a, uh, a quarterly, uh, an annual, and a three-year basis so that we had a kind of ramp of how, if, all the, if our three-year goals are this, how do they connect back to much more kind of short-term tactical um, goals? So within that scorecard, we'd have, um, for each of the kind of roles in the company, whether that's marketing, um, the delivery of projects, um, recruitment, finance, um, kind of three or four key stats that we think um, give a really good idea of um, how that area of the business is working. And if, there, if there's a problem with the numbers, that's, that's a good thing, really, because that gives us a chance to talk about it at the right time. So it's not kind of a performance management um, tool. It's much more about understanding where do we need to spend kind of time and energy rather than someone's necessarily doing anything kind of right or wrong. And so looking at the kind of, we, what we were trying to do is also build this kind of model that would allow us to kind of recruit around um, UK and Europe. So finding a replicable, um, simple, simplified model that we could then kind of clone out so that we didn't have to um, work out how to keep going through different um, growth barriers. And I think that we're definitely all going to hit different challenges um, kind of rolling this side of things out. But I think it feels like there's a kind of a simpler way of doing things um, that will actually be more straightforward. And I think, kind of, in conclusion, my kind of takeaways um, from what I've learned so far, I think we're definitely around, in the early days, I didn't really, I couldn't understand the difference between the single signal versus the noise of what we were doing. So where we were having problems and, and growing pains and things, I think we got stuck in a loop of doing lots of short-term fixes rather than actually um, understanding the root cause and recognizing that we needed to do kind of a model change uh, much more quickly. So I think that's definitely something that, um, I would want to make sure I pay too much more attention to myself in future. Um, I think for both, um, for culture, you know, you have an operational model and you have a company culture. And I think, you know, it's definitely true that you, you have one of each, whether you like it or not. You don't choose whether you, um, you know, you will have a company culture, whether you choose to, to kind of engage with it or understand it or influence it is a different question, but there will be a culture. It's not something that um, you kind of stick up on a poster and or if you don't have a poster, then it won't happen. And I think both are, you know, really hard to see clearly, particularly when you're really close to them. And it was useful for us having kind of external debate and advisors to be able to just get, gain that much more insight and see what we were doing really well at and, you know, was worth celebrating and see things that we weren't doing well at and we needed to change. And I think for both of them, again, what we found is, is the process and the ongoing process, really, of debating and defining both of them, that involving everyone, that's really important. It's not that you, can, um, you can't just kind of apply it to people and it will happen. You need to really um, engage people and work out what fits you and, and what will work for you. And that's, I think, what we found, you know, looking, you know, I did kind of a fair bit of research and reading in some ways. And... There isn't, I, what I realized, I guess, is there isn't a perfect model. It's not that the model on the shelf is kind of good or bad. It's your challenge in how you're going to apply it. How are you actually, how relevant is it to you? And what's your route to actually making it your own? And I think that's the bit that um, it wasn't kind of clear at the time. It's easy to kind of get excited about, oh, you know, let's do holacracy, let's do this, let's do that. All of them are going to be a really long journey from where you are today, probably. Depends where you are, but it's, it's understanding that, you, you need to understand what kind of 
fits with you, and but then start making those small changes all the way rather than spend, kind of get stuck in analysis paralysis of we could spend three years understanding different models. I, I, in hindsight, I wish we'd spent probably a little bit less time um, looking at options and more time looking at what immediate incremental changes could we start kind of rolling through. And for the future, I think, um, you know, self-set pay is something that people, companies that go in this direction is um, something that people choose to do more and more. I don't know if we'll go that way. I think it's it's some of the most kind of acutely personal and sensitive stuff that can go on, and I don't really understand how that would work for us yet, but it's something that um, look, is a natural conclusion in lots of the models, um, that peer-reviewed pay is something that um, people kind of work towards. Um, and I think also self-managing business units, that's where, going back to Ricardo Semler in um, Brazil, he, he ended up by kind of creating um, business units that could act independently because the overhead of managing um, these really large units was just really inefficient and bureaucratic. So trying to create kind of small business units that could self um, um, self kind of manage um, is something that um, is interesting. I don't really know. I think we're too small for um, quite a while for that to be relevant to us. But I think the idea of having those kind of inputs and outputs connected really closely and directly is an interesting one um, and something we'll definitely kind of keep an eye on in the future. So, yeah, thank you very much. Is there any questions? So the question was how big is the company? Today it's about 33 people and about two and a half million, two million worth of turnover. Uh, so we're mostly based in, uh, so historically we've been based in a town called Canterbury in the UK, which is just near London. Um, we're now, over the past kind of six months or so, we've become more and more distributed. So we're probably, um, probably only about 10% of the people, I think, by the end of next month will be not based in that area. But we're deliberately kind of putting in the infrastructure that means it's much less relevant whether you're working at home 10 miles from kind of our historical location or if you're working 100 miles away. The kind of the, the systems and practices um, we're working on now means that should be less relevant. Um, I think for us to grow, you know, the southeast of the UK is a really, um, it, for recruitment, is a really difficult market. So that's something that we're looking at of how would we continue to grow with the kind of people that we think are a great fit that we need to look um, a bit more imaginatively than where we have done in the past. Yeah, so the question was what's our largest project? I think. In terms of like initial spend, I think we'd probably be looking um, something like 200,000 UK. So that would be a full service build with design UX. Um, and then some clients would spend that on a recurring annual basis on the same platform, for example. Um, I don't think we've delivered as a one-time project anything larger than that. And I think for us to do those kind of projects, um, I think they change um, nature quite quickly. I'm not sure if we were going to do kind of a half a million pound project. I think that would require too much of a total percentage of our um, people that I'm not sure actually it would be healthy or a, a good idea necessarily. Yeah, and um, there was, it's a shame actually I didn't put a, a kind of a slide in. Um, what, what I kept coming back to was really the, um, the journey and the kind of how we do things is much more important than our actual size, if that makes sense. So we needed to keep a culture that um, people looked out for each other, it was fun to do, um, people enjoyed their work, um, that we felt like we were delivering really good work, that we were doing the right things for the clients. Um, we always have kind of really long-term relationships with clients, so we're often saying, you know, don't build this 50,000 pound um, feature, it's just a bad idea. And I think those are the things that we felt, um, or some examples of the things we felt were really important to keep, rather than um, moving to kind of a very sales driven culture where the target was we need to hit this revenue this quarter no matter what, and we'll compromise whatever it takes to kind of go that. And I think it d during this process it was interesting actually to kind of, and we just did some kind of setting some three year and ten year goals actually, and they weren't really around financial. Um, targets, they were actually around much more about the size of what we do, but making sure that we kept those other things in balance at the same time. Um, and I think it is important to make sure is your purpose to be a certain size or to hurt, uh, so size of revenue, size of people, type of profitability, you know, um, if, you can't, if you can't answer that actually, 
um, at a level where you're setting the strategy, I think you're going to have endless confusion in actually how can other people go and operate independently if they don't really know what's the best thing that could happen, this number or this happiness or this, this. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, so the question was around um, results versus process. Like, what's, how do you um, not compromise that everyone's doing things in wildly different ways um, within the company? Um, I mean, I came, I came from a development background myself, so I've always, I think, been slightly too interested in the methodologies that we use or the um, IDEs or those sorts of things. And I definitely don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I probably only borderline did at the time, but I think. I think what we found is that the cost of standardization, I think there's a sweet spot really, the cost of standardization can potentially be too high. So where you think that that standardization is really important, it isn't free. You have to train people, convince people, possibly force people, push those kind of tools or those practices onto people. And what, what we wanted to say was actually, if we've all followed the right methodology, but the project's three months late and over budget, well actually that's not success. The success that our clients are buying from us and that the company can take to the bank is, is the project on time and on budget. And those, those were the kind of, if we had to choose something, we thought, well, actually if developer A wants to use that IDE and developer B wants to use a different one, that's probably not the most important thing that we're gonna hold up at the end of the quarter and say, was that the kind of important decision we made? So I don't, I don't think there's kind of a black and white answer to it. I think it's just that you have to be, you have to be careful not to get too bogged down in things that actually your kind of smart, talented, motivated team can probably work out five different ways and how much time within the company do you want to spend necessarily. I mean, it could be, and I think there's also a balance between something like knowledge sharing for, versus mandating. So it may be that you spend lots of time encouraging people to do things but you don't want to lose their motivation by forcing them. So we have some things like security policies. There's some things we just say this has to work this way, and then there's another layer of things. So if they would risk the company integrity, client integrity, contractual issues, there's some things that we say you just absolutely must do, and then there's other things that we say, well, as long as you hit the big things. Um, I don't, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so we use, and that's a good point, so we do use Scrum actually, and that hasn't come up as a, a debate about whether we shouldn't yet, and I think that would be an interesting one actually if someone said, oh, you know, as a, as a fixed team we want to do this in a waterfall way, I think that would be an interesting kind of debate actually because um, we said we don't mandate those things, but I think we probably might at that point, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so in the past, uh, we did them as appraisals, um, mostly me doing them, and mostly the time I didn't get round to them often enough, which I think was a really bad thing actually, it's not good for anyone. Um, we then moved to um, peer reviews, so we tried to keep it really simple. You ask, I think, three peers um, two questions, and I think the qu question's around, what, can you tell me three things that I'm doing really well, and three things I could do differently? So that's completely self-driven. You just fill it out in a Google Doc. Um, it's up to you to go and choose the people that you want to ask those questions of, and you just have to record it in a place that I think you and your manager can see it, but you can choose to share it with everyone if you wish. And you also set, I think, a, a goal at that point um, for the next quarter. Um, but again, that goal could be, I'm gonna come to work, and no one's gonna challenge that. It's up to you. Because we, we, in the past, we've kind of been pushy, I think, about setting people's goals. And I realize that if it's not your goal, you're not gonna do it. It's just no, there's no point. They have to come from the individual. It's, uh, you know, too much process around that. Appraisal stuff, I think, is just, um, it's a false economy. It doesn't really get what you think it is um, from it. You just make, people will just keep jumping through the hoops, but nothing's actually, the real important stuff isn't changing. had any problems that we wouldn't have always had if that makes sense so rather than um, forcing most people to do things in a way they don't want just to make sure that um, one person isn't going to do the bad thing if that makes sense we kind of said well if someone has a, an issue at work that things aren't working that well they're probably going to have that no matter what so let's not make everyone work in a model that forces them not to be um, to do things in a certain way
Ya. Uh, so the question was around um, how do we allocate projects to teams um, and capacity. Um, so that's that's changing at the moment. So in the past, we could um, we would put a project team, we'd win a project. Um, we always try and bring the project team to pitches and to work and do the estimating and quoting on projects. So we try and we don't have um, a separate pitch team or a sales team who are doing that. We bring the people who are going to do the work into that process right from the start. So they're the ones estimating, specifying, etc. But occasionally that isn't true because either the right people aren't available or we need someone senior who isn't going to be the person doing all of the work. Um, if when we do win that project, then we put together the right team to deliver it, um, which should have been the same as the pitch team. And that then, but that's where we end up in that really complex resourcing environment because anyone could work across all of those different projects. That's what we were finding kind of wasn't efficient. Um, and we try and keep people on the same project for years if we can because you get that continuity. Um, but what I think we'll do in the future is we'll win a project, pod, uh, different kind of project teams or different pods will pitch, uh, will be working on the pitch of the project and then that pod will deliver the project. So rather than the resourcing being across 30 plus people, it will just be, it goes to this pod, it goes to that pod. Um, the talk I mentioned um, yesterday, um, uh, Orange is the New Teal or Teal is the New Orange or something, they, um, they talk in a bit more detail about how they do things like business development at scale that then matches back to those individual pods too. Um, they're a bit more advanced than we are in doing it, so it's probably worth watching if you didn't see it. Anything else? No, great, thank you very much.